In the book of Genesis, we're taught that God created everything. But more importantly, we're taught the order of events that those things were created in. Now, science also has an explanation for where the world began and an order that the things were created in. And at first glance, they appear to tell two very different stories with very different timelines. But would you be surprised if I told you that they were, in fact, both telling us the same exact story? Would you be surprised if I could use science to prove the events of the biblical account were true? Is it possible to have the Big Bang and God too? Or are the two accounts fundamentally at odds with one another? If you stick with me, I think you'll be surprised. In this documentary, we'll be taking a look at the things that most people get hung up on, analyze the apparent contradictions between science and the Bible, and use science to validate what scripture already tells us. I'm Michael Wilson, and this is the science behind the Bible. Why did the path of science and the Bible diverge? Satan caused a rebellion in heaven. Revelation 12 teaches us that Satan allied himself with one-third of the angels and made war in heaven. And then I witnessed in heaven another significant event. I saw a large red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, with seven crowns on his heads. His tail swept away one-third of the stars in the sky and he threw them to the earth. Satan lost this battle and was cast down to earth, and in Revelation 20.10 we discover what fate awaits him at the end of this age. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, and will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Because of this, we are warned that the devil has come down with great wrath, for he knows that his time is short. Satan knows his fate, and he isn't happy about it. He wants to get back at God, but his direct assault on heaven was defeated, and he has no further direct recourse. So the only way that he can get back at God is through an indirect assault on us. Satan knows that God loves us so much that he gave his only son to die for our salvation. Satan therefore knows that the only way to truly hurt God is to hurt us. John 3.16 tells us that God would prefer that no one would go to hell, but that we would choose everlasting life through Jesus' free gift of salvation. But the sad reality is that not all will accept that free gift. Satan knows that if he can convince you to reject that gift of salvation, then he can take you with him to that lake of fire where you will be eternally separated from God. Now nothing could injure God more than that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And so since the dawn of time, Satan has persisted in his lies in an effort to deceive you into rejecting God's free gift of salvation. One of the best ways Satan can achieve this goal is to make you believe that the Bible is filled with contradiction and lies. Now, if any portion of the Bible is untrue, it would give you just cause to reject it entirely. The perversion of science and a misunderstanding of scripture are key ingredients in the enemy's plan of deception. It's a common misbelief that scientists are by far and large atheists and unbelievers in the Bible, but a study by the Pew Research Center revealed that over half of scientists do believe in some form of higher power. So where did this idea that scientists are all unbelievers come from? It goes back to the enemy's plan of deception that we were just talking about. 
Satan has found a way to twist science into seemingly contradicting the Bible, and he uses a minority number of loud scientists to further that message. But the fact is, as scientists, we understand the mathematical truths dictating the order of the universe, and we recognize the impossibility of it all being some sort of cosmic accident. But to those who don't have a strong background in science, those concepts might as well fall into the category of black magic. It's something that they don't understand, and humans have a long harbored innate fear of the unknown. It isn't uncommon, therefore, for Christian believers to shy away from science out of a fear that they would somehow be wooed by its seemingly anti-biblical message. But nothing could be further from the truth. I find that the more I learn about science, the more it solidifies and justifies my faith. The Bible tells us a pursuit of science will lead straight to God. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day they continue to speak. Night after night they make him known. They speak without sound or word their voice is never heard, yet their message has gone throughout the earth, and their words to all the world. This is one of my favorite passages in the Bible because it underscores the notion that we can use science to justify the existence of God. Here the Bible is telling us that the science of astronomy proclaims the glory of God, the night sky makes him known night after night, yet the world cannot hear their message. I love all the sciences, but astronomy is my favorite. I've been studying it since I was about five years old, and I'm telling you it is possible to train yourself to hear the message from the stars the Bible is telling us about. Now the Bible says the stars speak this message without words, which makes sense. We discover that the message is in fact spoken through the universal language of science. And indeed, just as the Bible says, science is a universal constant, a language that transcends all other language barriers, and is therefore the one type of message that is capable of spreading throughout all the world. This is our family nativity. Every year at Christmas time, countless families display something just like this in their home. Now, I like ours because the holidays can be such a busy time. I find it helps recenter my thoughts on the reason for the season. Here we see baby Jesus and Mary and Joseph. And look, the three magi have come to bring gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Only it didn't really happen that way in the Bible, did it? According to the Bible, the three magi did not arrive on the night of Jesus' birth. Perhaps you already knew this little piece of Bible trivia. If not, allow me to elaborate. In Luke 2, verses 8 through 20, it's revealed that shepherds, not magi, were abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock at night, when the angels appeared and made the announcement of Jesus' birth known. In verse 16, we see that it was these shepherds that came to Jesus that first night, not the Magi. We read about the Magi in Matthew chapter 2. The Bible says, There came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. There is nothing in the scripture to indicate that they were kings or that they were only three in number. The notion that there were only three of them probably comes from the fact that they bring three gifts. The star leads the Magi to Jesus, where it is said that they enter into the house, not a manger. In Luke, Jesus is referred to as a babe, but in Matthew, he's referred to as a young child. All of this indicates the Magi arrived after his birth, possibly several months afterward. So where did this common misconception about the manger scene come from? There's a well-established psychological phenomenon called the Mandela Effect, which occurs when a large number of people remember something differently than how it really occurred. And that's what's happening here. This actually happens several times throughout the Bible. The lessons many of us were taught in our Sunday school classes may not be 100% accurate when held to the standard of the scripture itself. In other words, it's possible things we think are true about the Bible, interpretations we've been told our whole lives, may actually be flawed when we actually start to analyze the scriptures. You may have heard that the fall of man occurred when Adam and Eve ate the apple. 
But the Bible refers to it as a fruit and never defines it as an apple specifically. And yet the apple appears throughout Renaissance art depicting the scene. I've even heard people attribute the phrase, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few to the Bible. But that's actually a quote from Star Trek. These are all examples of the biblical Mandela effect. The reason I'm telling you this is because Satan has been perverting science and our understanding of Scripture for a long time in an effort to undermine biblical credibility. Many of those lies are well founded in this Mandela effect. There are things that we think the Bible says about creation that are actually wrong. But don't take my word for it. I'll be citing everything directly from the Bible itself in an effort to finally break down these misconceptions. As long as you approach this with an open mind, I think you'll find the possibilities of what I'm suggesting to be really quite fascinating. By listening to the heavens, scientists have collected all kinds of data to support the notion that the Big Bang created the universe, but the Bible tells us that God created the universe. This is the single biggest apparent contradiction that so many just can't seem to get past. So we're going to start there.